So it seems to be a little bit US talk today because like uh, the first day I have three persons right in the St. Petersburg and right now I am the only one in in Europe or in Russia and two of them uh, two of you are in the US. So how is it feeling to be in US? Can you tell me right now? Like is it sunny? Is it what, what's happening there? It, it's sunny. It's uh, it's the middle of the day. Uh, it feels pretty good. And there is a heat, a heat wave rolling in, so it's, heat uh, wave it's hot in. here. Okay, okay. And like, uh, Denise in Seattle, right? So you don't have you you have rainy day. I'm pretty sure. Uh, usually yes, but today it's also sunny. So uh, it's a, it looks like it's a sunny belt from the east coast to the west coast. Okay, that's pretty nice. So, uh, since I know not a lot about distributed systems, I'm I'm a little bit it's like not very good in in that. Sorry about that. So, I would invite Denis to present Nathan and to talk a little bit about their talk itself. Could you do that? Oh, sure. Uh, let me introduce uh, Nathan Van Bechten uh, to the audience. Uh, Nathan is a staff engineer, senior staff engineer at uh, Cockroach Labs, and he's responsible for the projects with the company-wide impact. One of the, his previous work is uh, parallel commits, uh, parallel commits protocol, uh, which si significantly improved the latency of the transaction and is a genuine new contribution to the area of uh, transactional research. Uh, Irfan. Uh, Sharif will make a talk about this protocol tomorrow, and I encourage everyone not to miss it. And so, so are, 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 the, are these two talks are connected, or what? Like, is it good to come to other talk without watching this one, or you should like definitely watch this talk and then move to their year funds talk? I, I, I think they are. Um, uh, they are independent, so they cover different parts of the uh, DB, but uh, they, they both touch very interesting uh, aspects of the uh, database. I, I, I like both of them. They are both very, uh, really interesting. Um, yeah. And, and the yeah. latest... Uh, yeah, the latest the <laughs> yeah, that's a good uh, uh, thing. Come, come to the both. And uh, the recent Nathan's work is also about the latency optimizations. They either are caused by uh, uh, controlling the placement strategy of the uh, different replicas or by tuning the trade-offs between the read and write conflicts of the uh, global transactions. So I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to listening to it. Okay, great. So Thanks, pro probably probably should we start or Nathan, you want to say more about the talk or something like that? No, nothing. Why don't we dive right in? Okay. Okay. So please share your wisdom with us. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, we we are waiting for it. All right. Well, thank you too. All right. I see my slides over here, so I'm going to jump over. Hi, everyone. My name is Nathan Van Benskoten. I'm an engineer working on CockroachDB, and I'm calling in from New York to give this talk. It's a real honor to be asked to present here at Hydra. I've seen some of the talks in the past, and I've learned a lot from them. And so I wanted to thank everyone involved in organizing the conference, both in, pat, both in, both in past years and especially in this year with all that's going on around the world. So I'm going to give a talk about globally distributed databases and the technical challenges that must be overcome to make them possible. Specifically, I'm going to talk about new SQL databases, a new breed of database system that tries to bridge the scalability and fault tolerance of NoSQL systems with the acid guarantees of traditional relational databases. My goal for the talk is to demonstrate that these new systems can be run at a global scale, just like some of the NoSQL systems that came before them. And while doing so, they're able to make stronger guarantees about data integrity, which unlocks distributed global distribution for many new applications. But the flip side here is that these systems need to be more careful about how they model data, how they distribute data, and how they perform transactions on top of this data. 
Without care, these systems often end up trading performance for safety. And that's especially true in a global setting. So my goal here is to convince you that this doesn't have to be a choice and that you can have both. But before all that, I'm gonna start this talk off with a bit of a challenge. I'm gonna present a simple task, place some requirements on it, and then we're gonna to try to solve it together over the, next, over the course of the next hour. We're gonna design a system that can do one thing, one very simple thing. We're gonna design a system that can process orders. You can imagine we're a marketplace and we have some customers and some products and we'll let customers place orders for those products. So that's easy. We'll model the system with three tables, a products table, an orders table, and a customer's table. But now come the requirements. First, we're told that we can't allow new orders for non-existing customers or products. And we need strong guarantees here. If a customer deletes their profile, we can't allow any new orders by that customer. Similarly, if a product is removed from the system, it can't be purchased beyond this point. So already, we need a system that supports consistent cross-table transactions. Luckily, we're gonna be using a relational database. So this is mostly a given. And in fact, we can express these constraints statically in our schema. We'll add some foreign keys to enforce referential integrity and rely on SQL to handle everything behind the scenes. So now we learned about our next requirement. Our business is growing beyond the scale that a traditional database can handle. So we have two options. We either scale up and buy increasingly more expensive hardware, or we scale out and run our database over a cluster of machines. For the moment, either of these options will probably do. But next, we're told that the system needs to stay online no matter what. Every hour we're offline costs us large amounts of money and degrades trust in our service. So we need to be able to survive the failure of individual machines, data centers, or even geographic regions and keep on running. So it's starting to look like horizontal scaling is the right choice. If we need to survive data center or even region failures and stay online, we need to replicate data across failure domain boundaries so that if one goes down, Another can pick, off, pick up where the first left off and keep processing orders. And finally, we're told that in order to provide a competitive service, we need these orders to be fast from each of our markets across the world. We're given a budget of 20 milliseconds to process one of these new orders. With this latency budget, we simply can't rely on a single monolithic system anymore. Even if it could handle our scale, a single database instance in Oregon isn't gonna allow us to meet our latency goals for our Eastern European market. So we need to turn to some kind of clustered global database that can accept writes from multiple locations. So how are we gonna accomplish these goals? Each one imposes different constraints and yet they're each fairly reasonable on their own. I'm sure many watching this talk have dealt with some of these problems in the past. These are the kind of challenges that new SQL systems were meant to solve. Because there's really no other good way to solve all of these problems at once. And so this talk is about how we can solve this challenge using a new SQL database system. Since we're gonna be talking about new SQL databases, it's worth introducing them and talking about how they differ from other systems and why they're becoming more popular over time. I'll preface this by reminding everyone that Andy Pavlo is gonna be doing a 10 year retrospective on new SQL systems tomorrow. And I'm sure that will be significantly more thorough than I intend to be here. Knowing Andy, it will also be extremely entertaining. So I'd encourage people to watch. But for now, I'll just give the overview. A lot of focus gets placed on the SQL aspect of this comparison. We have single node SQL databases, we have no SQL databases, and now we have new SQL databases. But SQL is really just a relational data model in an accompanying query language. So why are we placing so much emphasis on this aspect of the system? Well, I like to flip the term around and think about the qualifier 
as a constraint that dictates properties of the system. So instead of thinking, does this distributed system expose a SQL interface? I like to think, could SQL be built on top of this distributed system? Is the system powerful enough to express SQL? It doesn't provide applications built on top with the tools and the guarantees that something like SQL or something like a social network or something like a banking application would need. And when you think of it like that, it becomes a much more interesting question. Because you look at SQL and you start to see a lot of very powerful constructs that make certain demands on the underlying system. And these demands aren't SQL specific. A great example of this is secondary indexes. These are extremely important for applications. And so even many NoSQL systems have had to add support in some form or fashion and with varying compromises. But when a system needs to implement the full generality of SQL, it really can't take shortcuts here. And so these constraints dictate various design parameters of the system. And in turn, these design parameters dictate implementation choices. To ensure strong consistency, these new SQL systems almost exclusively use leader-based consensus protocols, which mandate some degree of synchronous replication. They often, but not always, use a partition consensus scheme with some reliance on clock sync. They often implement full serializable isolation to protect against concurrency anomalies. And finally, they have to be more deliberate about the cases in which they expose weaker consistency levels opting for something like a timeline consistent stale read instead of a fully inconsistent read. And these implementation choices are what make it challenging to deploy this at a global scale. If we're using leader-based consensus protocols because we can't tolerate lost rights due to an eventual consistency conflict resolution policy, we need to assign a leader to data. And only that leader can initiate rights. On top of this, we also need to combat a large amount of replication latency because we will be synchronously replicating to ensure survivability without data loss. And finally, if we want serializable isolation, then we need to be able to talk about global, totally ordered transaction histories. And so there are some big challenges that come with providing strong guarantees, but they are insurmountable. So I'm going to frame a lot of this discussion on how we can use a new SQL database to solve our original challenge using CockroachDB, one instance of a new SQL database. This is both because it's the system that I'm most, in, most familiar with and because it has recently made large strides in this area to make this all much easier. Over the past year, Cockroach has introduced a series of changes that make global deployments easier and more powerful. These changes include promoting the management of geographic regions to a first-class concept in the system. Then, using this concept, it introduced goal-oriented data placement policies to optimize for survivability and for latency. This was made possible through the introduction of non-voting replicas. Within the SQL engine, a concept of implicit table partitioning was added. And then a series of cost-based optimizations were built on top of this specifically to target locality awareness. And finally, the serializable transaction model was extended to support low latency, globally consistent reads served from any replica in the system. We're gonna learn about each of these topics and see how they all compose. Then we'll be able to return to our original challenge and solve it fearlessly, knowing that we're backed by strong guarantees. So let's talk about CockroachDB. CockroachDB is a source available relational database that's been around for seven years. It was originally inspired by Google Spanner, but it's since diverged in a number of ways. Under the hood, Cockroach is architected as a cluster of nodes that presents itself as a single logical database. These nodes form a shared nothing architecture with each node responsible for a portion of data storage and for, of query processing. Now, if you want to scale that database, you simply add more nodes. You point a node at the cluster, and it instantly re rebalances the data across all nodes to incorporate the new resources. And this isn't just scaling storage capacity. With the addition of each new node, you also scale out the volume of transactions 
that the single logical database can handle. Every node in Cockroach is a consistent gateway to the entirety of the database, meaning that if, as you add more nodes, you scale both reads and writes. But we can go a step further. We can deliver that scale, not just within a single data center, but beyond this. Cockroach can scale across the, the database across multiple regions and even multiple cloud providers. The system is active-active, and it uses the Raft consensus protocol to provide consistent access to data, even as portions of the system fail. The way this works is that data is broken up in Cockroach into 512 megabyte chunks called ranges. Each range runs its own instance of a Raft group with a default replication factor of three. And so different ranges can have different leader replicas. The system then layers on a time-based leasing mechanism to allow this leader to serve strongly consistent reads locally. But of course, coordination is required for writes, and the leader of a piece of data needs to be involved in every write. Finally, for all of those reasons that we talked about before, the system is built with a localization of data in mind. It offers localization without compromising on the strong guarantees of data integrity. Applications are still presented with a single logical database and can still rely on ACID properties. So the question then becomes, how do we make this perform well? And how do we make this easy to use? This is where the new additions to CockroachDB come into play. Cockroach allows application developers to optimize performance in their SQL schema without needing to change application logic. The system provides three tools here, which are presented as extensions to SQL's data definition language. It provides a notion of database regions, allowing a user to configure the geographic regions that a given database operates within. It provides configurable survival goals, allowing a user to declare the types of failures that they need to be able to survive. And it provides a notion of table locality, which instructs Cockroach on how to optimize access to a given table's data. Now, the thing I want to point out here is that these are abstract configurations that help manage the complexity of SQL without ever breaking SQL semantics themselves. The useful analogy here is SQL indexes. Indexes are an abstraction over a physical concern. Because SQL is a declarative query language, queries don't need to know about indexes. And the inclusion of an index will never change the result of a query. And yet, Indexes are an incredibly important tool exposed at the schema level for managing query performance. In Cockroach, these are the three, the three tools for managing the performance of global databases. Let's start with the easiest one. Each database in Cockroach is configured to operate in one or more geographic regions. And this is configured exactly as you would expect in SQL. By configuring a database's regions, we tell Cockroach where to store copies of the database. Each region stores a full copy of the database, and we'll see why this is important shortly. A natural question to ask here is what we mean by a region. In this context, a region is a grouping of machines that are separated from other groups by enough latency such that it makes sense to consider their data access disjoint. So this is typically anywhere around or above 10 milliseconds. The regions often correspond directly to cloud service provider regions, but each cockroach process can be configured with an arbitrary region string at CERTA. Similarly, cockroach will add some sugar around cloud service provider availability zones, but this is treated just like any other failure domain signifier under the hood. And what I mean by that is that if cockroach is asked to place multiple replicas for a piece of data in the same region, and it has zones available, it will spread those replicas across those zones. But configuring a database's region does one more thing. And this part's pretty cool. Multi-region databases in Cockroach each contain a database scoped SQL enum data type called CRDB internal region. And when a user adds a new region to a database, a schema change is run under the hood to add a new possible value to this enum. 
Similarly, when the user drops a region from a database, that region will no longer be valid in the enum type. So we can now use this internal enum type to bridge the gap between multi-region DDL statements and multi-region DML statements. We can talk about regions at the schema level or at the value level. And this will become critical when we start talking about modeling data locality at increasing levels of granularity. So that's all for database regions, but we want to keep them in mind as we explore the other two multi-region knobs so we can see how things compose. So as I mentioned before, each database is also configured with a survival goal. This dictates the kinds of failures that a database can survive. The options range from surviving a single zone failure to surviving an entire region failure. And what we'll see is that this choice dictates replica placement and replication policies under the hood. I'll start by saying that naively, the thing to do once we have a notion of database regions is to place a single voting replica in each configured region. This would provide low latency, stale read access to all data in all regions. It would also mean that because Cockroach is using quorum writes, it could tolerate a region failure once at least three regions have been added to a database. Because we only need to wait for two of those three regions to vote for any given write. So we're done, right? Do we even need a notion of survival goals? Well, it turns out that this isn't as ideal as it sounds. And we can see that in action as we add more regions. This is what happens when a new region is added. We now have a quorum size of four, so we have to wait for three of the four regions to vote for any given write. So that's not great, but it is still manageable. How about once we add two more regions? Well, now we're waiting for four of the six regions on any given write. What's worse is that these regions are likely spread over greater and greater distances, meaning that that fourth vote might take a significant amount of time to complete. And so we're getting ourselves in trouble by coupling two competing concerns. Replication factor, meaning how many copies of the data we have, and failure tolerance, meaning how severe of a failure can we tolerate without losing availability. And the result is going to be unpredictable and broadly suboptimal latency. Luckily, quorum, tool, quorum systems have a tool that can help us decouple these concerns. They're called non-voting replicas. These are replicas that learn about replication decisions, but don't partake in making those decisions. And so they don't impact right latency. Many here might know them by another name, asynchronous replication. And so with non-voting replicas, we can pin a replication group's voting count while expanding its data footprint. This allows us to create a replication scheme that looks something more like what we see here. We create a voting diameter just large enough to be able to tolerate a single region failure, and then use non-voting replicas everywhere else to provide low latency reads in all regions. We also make one more tweak to region survivability. While we keep voting replicas in exactly three regions, we actually increase the voting replica count to five. This means that not only can we tolerate the failure of an entire region and stay online, but we can also tolerate the failure of a single node without impacting client perceived latency. For instance, if the leader dies, we can keep leadership in that same region. Similarly, if any single voting follower dies, we can still achieve consensus with votes from the region closest to the leader. So what's become apparent is that now that we've decoupled data placement from the synchronous replication diameter, we can start discussing the latency survivability trade-off head on. If a database needs to survive a region failure, the most optimal thing the system can do is vote on new writes across three nearby regions and asynchronously replicate to all other regions. However, if the database only needs to survive an availability zone failure, which is a very reasonable choice for some deployments, given the way that cloud providers isolate zones in the same region, then the most optimal thing the system can do is vote across three avail availability zones, 
and asynchronously replicate across regions. And this is exactly what we do with zone survivability. And in fact, zone survivability is actually the default survival goal for new databases. Notice that we do all this through a declarative survival goal, a declaration of intent. When a user sets their survival goal, Cockroach will reconfigure voting and non-voting replicas accordingly to minimize latency while ensuring the user's desired survival goal. Users do need to understand that this has an impact on write latency, but they don't need to understand exactly what this impact is on the placement of each and every voting and non-voting replica. So finally, the most interesting tool that Cockroach provides for tuning performance is a table's locality setting. The locality setting is meant to be a reflection of the access locality on the table itself. Does the table's data have strong affinity to one region? Is access equally from all regions? That's what we're trying to get at here. There are two table localities, regional and global. Regional tables are for data with strong access locality. They provide low latency reads and writes from a single region. Global tables are for data with weak access locality. They provide low latency reads from all regions in exchange for slower writes. So we're gonna talk about each of these in more detail, but before doing that, it's worth pointing out that when we're talking about performance here, we're talking about the performance of strongly consistent access. Regardless of table locality, stale reads and read-only snapshot transactions can always be used to achieve low latency access to data in all regions. So you can always run expensive read-only analytics queries with no cross-region communication, regardless of where they're run from. So let's dive deeper. The default table locality setting is regional. Again, this is meant for localized data, data with access locality, meaning that it's primarily read and written to from a single region. The standard version of a regional table is configured to provide optimal performance from a single region across an entire table. And in fact, by default, the same optimized region is used across all regional tables in a database, unless otherwise specified. We call this default optimized region the database's primary region. And it corresponds to the first region added to the database. So we now know just enough to ask the question, what if I ignore all of this? Or maybe another way to ask this is, what if I take an existing postgres backed application and move it over to Cockroach without configuring any table locality settings? These are both good questions. Let's start with the database in a single region. This will of course provide good read and write access to applications in that same region. If we then add two more regions to the database, what happens? Well, because the default survival goal is zone survivability, we're still not running distributed consensus across regions. So performance stays identical to apps from within the original region from with consistent reads and writes. However, we can now serve low latency stale reads from the other two regions. We can also fail over to another region, but with some data loss. If we squint, we can see that this is pretty much exactly where most other global databases stop. Fast, consistent access from one region, stale read-only access from all other regions, and failover with data loss to other regions. Writing from multiple regions simply isn't a thing, which is maybe okay for certain applications. So without touching survival goals or table locality settings, we have a pretty sane default. However, if data loss is not acceptable in the presence of a region failure, then we can set a region survival goal. This will slow down writes, but will ensure no loss of data during a region failover event. And still, we haven't touched table locality settings. But let's imagine now that we want to start allowing writes to our database from multiple regions. A single writer region can only get us so far 
when we're trying to offer a low latency experience across the globe. In fact, I posit this is one of the single biggest determinants of whether a global database truly lives up to its name. Without supporting low latency writes from multiple regions, how much better off are we than with a single region database and a caching layer on top? So in CockroachDB, this is where the regional tables really start to come into play. By default, all tables in Cockroach are regional tables. And specifically, the regional tables that offer low latency writes in the database's primary region. But they can also be configured to provide low latency write access in other regions instead. We call this region the table's home region. So on a table by table basis, we can configure who gets good write performance by configuring the table's home region. Under the hood, this translates to moving the table's leader and its voting replicas to where we want to provide fast write access, that being the table's home region. But note that this is just a performance concern. SQL semantics are preserved regardless of where operations are performed, and applications can run serializable transactions across all data regardless of individual data homing. You can imagine how this might be used. Maybe we have one table with strong access locality from Southeast Asia, or we have another table with strong access locality from Northern Europe. Or maybe we create a South American users table and a North American users table, and we assign their homes accordingly. Doing so would ensure that users get fast local experiences regardless of where they live. At this point, it's worth taking a step back and asking, why do we need regional tables and home regions at all? This isn't a concept that exists in leaderless systems like Cassandra, where it can write to any table from any region. It's also not a concept that exists in multi-leader systems, like the one shown here. If you remember from the beginning of this talk, I mentioned that one of the salient points of new SQL systems is that they provide strong consistency to avoid the potential for data loss or corruption associated with something like a last writer wins conflict resolution policy. And as a result, they're often driven to use a leader-based consensus schemes. Cockroach is no exception. Only leaders can initiate writes. So part of what configuring the home for these regional tables is doing is configuring where this leader lives for the table. So the flexibility of regional tables gives us safety and performance. We can get low latency reads and writes from where we need them and maintain strong consistency. So this all works and it's a reasonable stopping point, but it does leave something to be desired because we're configuring access locality with per table granularity. In other words, we're still configuring who gets fast access to what data at the schema level. It's often the case that we want to be more flexible than this. We want to create a single table where access locality is configured on a row by row basis. We want to operate at a per row level because it makes locality more dynamic and it allows SQL to do what SQL does best, which is to enforce integrity constraints and to hide complexity behind declarative query execution. This is where an extension to regional tables called regional by row tables comes into the picture. At a high level, regional by row tables are just like normal regional tables, except that they allow each row to configure its own home region independently. There are two key ingredients that make, go into making this possible. The first is that each row in a regional by row table is given a hidden column called CRDB region. Remember that enum data type we talked about earlier? This is where that comes into play. Each row's hidden region column can be set to any of the database's regions and nothing more. And so we can use this to associate a home region with each row. We then go a step further and partition the entire table on this column. And we pin the leader of different partitions to their corresponding regions. Of course, this is all done behind the scenes. 
Users don't actually have to run any of these schema changes themselves. So we now have a single table with rows that have variable access cost, depending on their individual homes. The first question to ask, while not terribly interesting, is why is this column hidden? The answer is that by hiding the column, we avoid breaking existing SQL logic. Select statements can return the column, but they don't have to. And they won't unless asked to. And mutations like inserts won't expect the column unless told about it. So again, the theme here is that we can't break SQL syntax or semantics. Users can, in can interact with this homing information, but they don't need to. So then the next question to ask is, what happens if I don't specify a home region when creating a row? The answer is that if the home region isn't provided, it's auto-determined based on where the row is created. In other words, based on which node in the system evaluates the insert statement. And there's very little magic here. This is just based on the column's default expression, which invokes a built-in function that returns the region where the statement is running. We call this auto homing. The intuition here is that if a row is created in one region, it's most likely to be accessed again in that region. And conveniently, by inserting rows locally, these inserts can be performed with low latency. But if the guess here is wrong, users can always run an update statement to change a row's home region. And this is exactly what you'd expect, moving the row between partitions to ensure that it has fast write access in the specified region. You can imagine that the system could even re-home rows, meaning that it could change their home region based on observed access patterns to optimize for performance. This is what projects like Peanuts from Yahoo and the Slog system from the University of Maryland do. While it's not something Cockroach currently does, it is thematically aligned with everything else here and it's something we're investigating. One of the challenges we ran into when building regional by row tables was determining how to preserve the semantics of unique constraints once a table has been partitioned. It may or it may not come as a surprise to people, but this is not something many SQL systems that contain a notion of table partitioning support. These systems almost always enforce unique constraints using an index. And they defer to collisions in this index to detect duplicate rows. Partitioning the index would prevent unique violations from being detected as collisions. So cross-partition unique constraints are simply forbidden. But forbidding unique constraints in regional by row tables wasn't an option here. Neither was only enforcing uniqueness within a region. Either approach would break expected SQL semantics and limit the utility of regional by row tables. It would also preclude an important optimization we're about to discuss regarding querying of unique columns. So instead, Cockroach implemented a form of uniqueness constraint backed by a partitioned index. The idea here is that we main per, maintain per region index, indexes and check across these indexes to detect duplicate keys. This ended up looking quite similar to a foreign key post query check. These constraints Constraint checks are run after inserts or updates that modify columns in the unique constraint. And this results in a fan out query to each region to enforce the uniqueness property. Within each region, the lookup is efficient. And so the cost of the constraint check is proportional to the number of regions. One quick thing I'd like to point out here is that nothing that we've talked about right now is all that revolutionary. We don't have a global index so we check each region to enforce uniqueness. That's pretty easy to understand. But what I find fascinating is that even without any guidance, features like enums, partitioning, and a sufficiently advanced cost-based optimizer compose to find this approach. This isn't custom logic. We're literally just running the first query here, and it's resulting in the fan out.
But even though we can now enforce global un uniqueness using this strategy, we prefer not to, because these checks can be expensive. They're broadcasting point lookups to each region. And they can't use stale local reads from follower replicas, because they need to be transactionally consistent. So while we think they're important to support the full generality of SQL, we also try to avoid the checks whenever we can. The easiest case where these checks can be avoided are when a table has no global uniqueness. This means that the table has no explicit primary key and no other unique constraint. So there's nothing to enforce. A second case here where we omit uniqueness checks is when uniqueness is being enforced on a UUID type and the user allows Cockroach to generate the value using a built-in function. In this case, we know the value has never been used before and deem the probability of collision to be so low on the order of 1 over 10 to the 18th power that we can safely omit the check. A third case that is being investigated is introducing a specialized, sequence-like data type that specifically does not allow users to find values. By not allowing users to set the value manually, we can be sure that only unique values from the sequence are used. The last thing to discuss about regional by row tables are some of the optimizations that Cockroach has, has in its cost-based optimizer to leverage access locality. The most important of these is called locality optimized search. The optimization is enabled whenever users issue point lookups on unique columns in regional by row tables. For instance, when, running a, when looking up a row by its primary key. And this is part of the reason why we went through so much trouble to allow global uniqueness. In such cases, the optimizer knows that if a matching row is found in one region, it can't be found in any other region. It also knows that searching in the local region will be significantly faster than searching in remote regions. So instead of immediately performing a per region fan out, the optimizer splits the query into two stages, expressed through this short circuiting union all operator. First, it searches in the local region for the matching row. If this hits, it immediately returns, having served the query locally without any cross-region latency. However, if it misses, it fans out to all other regions in parallel. And this doesn't just apply to selects. Because even mutations like deletes and updates are passed through the cost-based optimizer. So the same optimization gets applied to their initial row scan as well. This means that mutations of rows homed in the same region as the SQL gateway are also performed with low latency. Though, of course, because they are writes, they're subject to consensus latency, which is dictated by the database's survival rule. So using this optimization and its derivatives, Cockroach is able to exploit access locality transparently without requiring users to specify or keep track of which rows are homed in which regions without statically tying a row to a single region indefinitely. In this sense, the system works very much like a cache. So to wrap up, let's look at regional by row tables latency profile. I've broken things down into various kinds of SQL operations and split those into those touching locally home data and those touching remotely home data. And I'll reiterate that these are statements run by an application with no understanding of homing. If it were to include region information in a predicate, which is fully allowed, we could do better. But that would require application changes and would require a static mapping between data and its home region. So we can see that access locality is key for good performance in regional by row tables. If we're operating on locally home data, almost all operations strongly consistent serializable operations are run with local latency. So while this all works great for localized data, where it makes sense to assign a, a home to a piece of information, it hits issues when presented with data and data access with little affinity to a specific region. 
Specifically, it runs into issues when a user needs strong, consistent, meaning not stale, access to the same set of rows from multiple regions. This is where global tables come into play. Global tables are meant to provide low latency, strong and consistent reads from all regions. I drew a distinction there between stale and non-stale reads. And I've actually done so in a few places throughout this talk. So to fully motivate global tables, I want to take a quick detour and talk about what stale reads are and why they can't be used in all situations. A stale read is a historical read at some timestamp in the past. Those familiar with the literature may recognize this as offering a consistent prefix guarantee. And the idea here is that by reading in the past, Cockroach can serve the read from voting or not voting follower replicas instead of being forced to serve the read from the leader of a piece of data. Let's see how these work. Each raft group in Cockroach maintains a piece of information called a closed timestamp. The closed timestamp is a promise that no leader for the group will allow a write at an MVCC timestamp at or below what's already been closed. When a leader performs a write, it also attaches a new closed timestamp to the raft entry. This closed timestamp typically lags present time by about three seconds. When followers apply this entry, they also bump their understanding of the closed timestamp to whatever was in the log. And this lets follower replicas know how stale a read has to be for them to be able to serve it. This also means that once a timestamp has been closed by a leader, writes at lower timestamps must be rejected, or at least pushed above the closed timestamp. There's a little more nuance here around inactive raft groups, and we have an optimization to progress their closed timestamp without waking them up. But that's not really important for what we're talking about here. The main thing to remember is that raft groups close time about three seconds in the past, meaning that followers can serve reads as long as they're about at least three seconds stale. There are two forms of stale reads, those with exact staleness and those with bounded staleness. This distinction relates to who chooses how far in the past to read. Exact staleness reads are efficient, but require a user to specify a staleness interval. Often this means conservatively reading far in the past to ensure the read can be served from a follower. Bounded staleness reads are marginally more expensive, but they have the property that they dynamically determine the read timestamp to minimize staleness while ensuring the reads are served locally and don't block. So either way, stale reads often come with a large latency benefit, as they can almost always be served in the local region without cross-region communication. Remember that this is the reason why we went through all of the trouble of placing a replica for each piece of data in every region. But stale reads also come with a major limitation. They can only be run from read-only transactions. Any transaction that needs to write will need all of its reads to be strongly consistent. Or we could get ourselves in all kinds of trouble with ACID. And so they can't use follower replicas to service reads. So while stale reads provide a large latency benefit and should be used when they are possible, they aren't applicable to all cases. So back to global tables. This table locality setting configures a table to provide strongly consistent low latency read access from all regions. In other words, reads from any replica, not just the leader, are strongly consistent. And this means that we can read from tables and read write transactions run from any region and always get low latency access. Of course, the trade-off here is write latency to these tables, which is penalized to provide these properties. To make this all possible, we had to add a significant extension to our transaction model, which we called non-blocking transactions. I said that the motivating use case here was data that's not localized to a single region. So the same piece of information is read often from all regions. The canonical example here is a reference table or a dimension table. Some kind of table that's localized, that localized data may reference in a foreign key, but that isn't localized itself. This was exactly the case we saw in our original challenge. 
There, we would expect for a customer and its orders to have strong access locality. If I live on the East Coast of the United States, then my customer profile and my orders will almost always be accessed there. However, the products that I'm ordering won't have a strong access locality. A customer in a completely different region will reference the same set of products when placing an order. So the reason why the parent table of a foreign key relationship makes for an interesting example is because the parent is read during a foreign key check, which is by definition in a read-write transaction. When I run this insert statement, the database is going to perform a foreign key lookup on the products and the customer's table in the same transaction. And these lookups need to be consistent. The customer's lookup will likely be fast because we expect our customer row to be homed in the same region that we're inserting from. But we don't have a natural home for rows in the products table because the same product is referenced everywhere. Global tables can save us here. As long as we're okay with slower writes on the products table, we can make this table fast for reads from all regions. And so no matter where we're running this insert statement from, we expect single digit millisecond latency. Let's see how global tables are implemented under the hood. <clears throat> Perhaps the most straightforward way we could have implemented them is by forcing writes to the table to synchronously write to every replica before committing. So instead of performing quorum writes, we could have a write everywhere, read anywhere scheme. This works, you know, it has a glaring issue, which is that a failure of any single replica would kill write availability. We're no longer fault tolerant, which is kind of a showstopper. Okay, so next approach. If we can't tolerate the availability loss of synchronously broadcasting, and we want to keep quorum writes, but we also don't want to visit the leader on every read, then maybe we can do what other systems do and perform quorum reads. Instead of reading from the leader, we can read from the closest majority of replicas to determine where, which value to return. This trades marginally better latency in cases where the leader is far away for more work on each read. But it doesn't even eliminate wide area network communication during reads. So this also isn't what we want. Well, maybe we can go back to our initial scheme of broadcasting rights to all replicas, but try to claw back some fault tolerance. The problem was that once a follower disappeared, maybe it crashed or maybe it was partitioned, we had no way to stop it from serving reads that could invalidate future writes. And so we had no way to safely perform a new write. Maybe we can give each replica a read lease and we periodically extend them. And so a partition follower can only serve reads up to some maximum MVCC timestamp. This means that if a replica disappears, we're only unable to serve writes for a limited period of time until that follower's read lease expires. Eventually, we will be able to write again. This is similar to the idea of quorum leases, and it's a great idea. We trade at slower writes, but we still ensure high availability. When designing global tables, we started down this path, but something didn't feel right. For starters, this was seriously complex to design. But more than that, we started thinking about low latency reads, not just in terms of average latency, but also in terms of tail latency. And the thing we noticed was that read-write contention on these tables would lead to significant latency spikes due to reads blocking on in-flight writes. You can imagine that from the perspective of a read, a consensus write is acquiring a distributed lock. The write is broadcast to all replicas across the globe, which check whether any reads have already invalidated the proposed write. If the write is invalid, the follower sends back a rejection and the write is rolled back. If the write is still valid, the follower durably apply, acquires a lock and acknowledges the write, blocking conflicting reads. These acts travel back to the leader, and if all replicas acknowledge the write, the followers are told to apply the write and release their locks. So that's a lock held for at least one global round trip of communication. But things are actually worse than this. 
We don't want reads to be able to starve writes. So we may need to introduce an initial round of communication to acquire locks earlier and determine what timestamp to even write at. Or we can do this optimistically, only falling back to two rounds of global communication in cases where a write is invalidated by a read. There are various analogies here that we can make to consensus protocols, like single directory Paxos, fast Paxos, and some of the extensions. But the point I'm trying to make here is that Paxos implies blocking on communication. And communication is not cheap when run across the globe. We're talking about a read that normally takes a few milliseconds, suddenly taking two or 300 milliseconds when waiting on a contend contending write. So we ask ourselves, how can we avoid this problem? How can we coordinate between reads and writes without blocking on communication? This led us to a realization. We realized we could use clocks and not locks to coordinate, just like Cockroach does in other areas of the system through its leasing mechanism. Now, Cockroach doesn't rely on sophisticated combinations of GPS and atomic clocks like Google's Spanner does. And yet, its hybrid logical clock scheme gives us fairly reliable clock synchronization, which is well below the 300 milliseconds or so we saw in the previous example. And with a little effort, using just software, we could drive this clock sync down much further. So we explored ways that we could use coarsely synchronized clocks to coordinate between reads and writes. This would allow us to move communication outside of read-write conflict boundaries. And this turned out to be a natural extension of what the system was already doing. The key idea here is that we push the timestamp of writes on these tables into the future. And we also push the notification of closed timestamps into the future. Remember that these are the notifications that a leader sends to its followers to tell them how far in the past they can serve reads. Only here, these notifications are in the future. So followers can serve present time reads with no staleness. So by shifting writes into the future, we get non-stale reads from all replicas. If there's no contention between reads and writes, this all works beautifully, and we avoid needing to give followers read leases. But that's not really saying much. If there is contention, how do we ensure consistency? In other words, how do we ensure the following two properties? Read your writes, meaning that once a write completes, any future read will observe the effect of that write. And monotonic reads, meaning that once a read completes, any future read will observe the same or a later value. Here's where the clocks come into play. To ensure read your writes, we introduce a concept called commit wait. Commit wait is a delay that writes will perform after committing, but before acknowledging the commit. This is a slight variation on what Google Spanner does to ensure external consistency. While well, writes to normal tables in Cockroach don't need a commit wait, Writes to global tables do. So this is actually why writes to global tables are slower. To ensure monotonic reads, we extend an existing concept in Cockroach called the read uncertainty interval. A reads uncertainty interval is an interval above its read timestamp, equal in size to the maximum clock offset between any two nodes. If a read observes a write in its uncertainty interval, it usually bumps its read timestamp above the write and immediately retries. However, if it observes a write in its uncertainty interval on a global table, it bumps its timestamp and waits until that timestamp will be in, which will be in the future, is, pre is below present time before retrying. So this means that the maximum time that a read will ever have to wait to coordinate with a write is equal to that maximum clock synchronization offset. This is a major improvement because not only is this less than the global communication latency, but it's also something we can continue to drive down. We're not limited by the speed of light here, and we can use various techniques within CockroachDB and within environments running CockroachDB, like the hosted CockroachDB offering, to improve synchronization. Of course, if we're assuming a reliance on clock synchronization, we need to have a discussion about what happens if clock sync bounds are violated. 
assuming a maximum rate of clock drift, Cockroach can, ensure, can do everything in its power to shut things down before clocks get too out of sync. But that's still not a complete answer. The full answer is that if clock skew is not properly detected in time, <clears throat> this can result in stale reads. This is transient and the data won't be corrupted or lost, but clients could observe violations of causal ordering between transactions. And this is actually a hazard that already existed and exists in any system with a read leasing mechanism. So this new use of clocks isn't introducing any new concerns. Now, a subtle point here is that sufficiently skewed clocks can result in violations of linearizability, but never serializability. In other words, causality is enforced in part through clocks, but isolation is not. So we see that using semi-synchronized clocks and this extension to our transaction model, we've managed to drive down the latency of reads on global tables, offering optimal latency in the case of uncontended reads and reliable tail latency that we can improve upon by improving clock synchronization. This is all possible because we move communication outside of read-write conflict boundaries on these global tables. So again, global tables pessimize write latency to optimize for read latency. So they're not a perfect fit in all cases, but they're an extremely important part of the puzzle for read-heavy data that doesn't have strong access locality and needs to be read in read-write transactions. So let's see where this leaves us. Let's take a look at how these two table locality settings combine, provide low latency, strongly consistent access in almost all cases. Regional tables are the default table locality setting. They provide low latency read and write access to locally home data with slower access to remotely home data. Data homing can be configured at the table level or at the row level. Global tables are the other table locality setting. They provide low latency read access in any region with slower write access across the board. So we see that we can get low latency in almost all cases. In fact, the only case that we can't achieve low latency, strongly consistent access is for writes to the same data from all regions. This is what the remaining case where weaker consistency levels and tools like CRDTs would still come into play. So with these new tools in our tool belt, we can now return to our original challenge with confidence. The requirements are still demanding, but we now have a better idea of how to approach them. Solutions for the first two come easy when using a distributed SQL system. Consistency and scalability are what these systems excel at. But the second two requirements are where our new tools will have to come into play. First, we can figure our database to run across the globe in each of the regions that we have a presence in. Then, to ensure maximal survivability, we instruct the database to replicate writes across regions. And finally, to ensure low latency access, we can figure tables to match access locality patterns. And that's it, challenge completed. So jumping back to where we started. New SQL systems take an opinionated stance on strong consistency and serializable isolation. This makes working in these systems safe, even when run across the globe, as application developers don't need to compromise on correctness or data integrity. What we've shown in this talk is that with the right tools, application developers don't need to compromise on performance either. We've used CockroachDB as an example and shown that with three declarative SQL level primitives, we can express survivability and performance goals, all without requiring invasive application changes. We've also shown the technical changes that went into making this all possible. These changes included prescriptive data placement policies, new locality aware SQL optimizations, and an extension to the system's distributed transaction model. What I've shown here is all part of CockroachDB's newest release, and we're excited to see how people use this. 
So thanks again for everyone joining this talk. And thanks again for everyone involved in organizing the conference. We're gonna be having a question session after this. And I'd encourage anyone who's interested to drop in and ask questions. Thank you. It was a wonderful talk. I uh, I have listened it for the second time, and I still was able to find something uh, what I've missed the first time. It's 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 really cool. I like how this uh, small change in uh, uh, in in the metadata uh, of the partition on, on of the of the table placement allows us to tune all of these parameters and to get some uh, uh, latency benefits. It's, it's, it's really interesting. Uh, I think we have a uh, couple of questions uh, in, uh, in, in chat. Uh, Igor uh, Gorbunov is asking, is it possible to replicate the uh, index table to avoid the fan out so to serve to, to do the lookup uh, uh, locally instead of asking the other regions to do it so it is um it, it's possible to have a global index instead of this partition per region index um what we found though is that you don't get a lot of benefit from doing so because it means that now that i have a global index i lose local rights now every right to the system at least those that change this, this table, um, they now need to go to some remote region and update this index. And so what we found is that it's, it's difficult to think about a, a table that has some local indexes and some global indexes. And it's actually a lot easier in SQL to express this as a global table and a, a regional by row table that has a foreign key into that global table. And so you, you have very clear semantics around the latency of writing to this global table and then writing to this regional by row table instead of having to think very deeply about whether a given mutation has to go change that, that global index. So th that's a great question. Uh, uh, got it, it's, it's clear, thank you. Uh, uh, another question is, uh, uh, is you mentioned that uh, one of the motivation of doing this work was uh, uh, new sovereignty laws that came in, coming up in different uh, uh, countries, and I'm 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 curious how this uh, affect your work. So I, I I bet Cockroach Lab started before GDPR was uh, uh, created, and also we have uh, other different local laws, very similar one. So I'm I'm curious how it affects your kind of a planning and uh, uh, new features and uh, how, how it affects the database's business in, in the whole. Yeah, so GDPR and, and data domiciling and, and these type of uh, legal um, constraints, they're, they're very, um, they, they do dramatically impact the, the ways that we have to build systems and the ways that we have to um, the ways that we have to design where data lives, um, the, the way that we've thought about this challenge to this point is that in the future, we imagine we will be introducing uh, first level primitives, similar to what we did with these database regions um, mm -hmm. to talk about domiciling groups or um, ways that you can say, I wanna partition this data off and not just partition where, the, where performance is fast, but actually partition where data placement is allowed and not let it escape this, this um, boundary, these boundaries uh, to comply with legal, uh, legal constraints. The, the way that this would work today with, with what we just talked about is that you would use a single cockroach to be cluster, but if you had certain data that needed to live within, let's say the European Union, you would create a second database within this cluster that you only add European regions to. And so you can still perform cross database transactions. And so kind of data on the wire is still allowed to cross boundaries. That, that's at least our reading of, of the laws. 
but data at rest needs to stay within the, uh, the European Union. Union. This is still kind of an emerging, uh, emerging area, I think, on, on the technical side mm -hmm. and on the legal side. It's, it's an interesting question. It's, uh, yeah, this, uh, I, I like how this uh, rules of the placement makes it explicit to reason about the, uh, the, the latency. It, it, it's, it's like an additional uh, contract uh, between the, the database and applications. Okay, yeah. Hello, I think uh, we're... Yeah, we are almost out of time, so. Uh, is there any short question probably or? or we should wrap up and then move to the Zoom, to the discussion Zoom. I think, I think um, uh, we touch most of the questions and uh, probably the rest we will uh, discuss in the discussion Zoom. Mm -hmm. Okay, Nathan, thank you very much for the exciting talk. Anyway, that, that, that was very interesting and thank you, Denise, for making the conversation. Yeah, though. Thank you very much. Good luck in the discussion zone. See you probably sometime later. Hope to offline next year. Bye. Yeah, I see you.